Hello and welcome, Dr. Jonathan Master. Jonathan, before we get stuck into our topic for today, tell us everything we need to know about you in 60 seconds. Well, you know, I I, uh, I I serve in the PCA, and it, my although I'm ordained as a as a teaching elder, my job is I'm president of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. So I have the opportunity to rub shoulders with students and professors and churches all the time. Really love that. I'm married, have two children, and uh, we live in the Greenville area, and we've lived here for about three years. Fantastic. And we're going to be talking about Reformed theology. You've just brought out a brand new book, right? Yeah, that's right. It's a it's a little book on on that exact topic, trying to define and explain the blessing of Reformed theology. Excellent. Well, let's do that now. What is Reformed theology and what is its history, Jonathan? That's probably the hardest question to answer, at least the hardest question I had to answer, because there are so many different definitions that people give. Basically, what I tried to narrow it down to was three things. First, it's it's the theology that comes out of the Protestant Reformation, not not the Lutheran branch of the Reformation, but the what we think of as the Reform branch, the the, the branch that encompasses John Calvin, and it takes the what have often been called the solas of the Reformation especially seriously with all of their implications. Now, those solas weren't developed until later, but I think they faithfully represent Reformed thinking. That that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that. It is wrapped up in an understanding of the outworking of God's plans in, in a covenant. And so covenant theology, I would I would mark as the second distinctive of Reformed theology. And then the third thing that I mentioned is it's expressed in historic creeds and confessions. So I'm trying to uh, argue that Reformed theology ties into a history, a public history of uh, theological uh, articulation within the church. Yeah, yeah, really helpful. So what isn't Reformed theology, but often gets lumped in? Well, again, it's a question of definition. I think sometimes when people talk about Reformed theology, they're speaking strictly in historical terms. And so then almost anything that comes out of the Protestant Reformation can be called Reformed theology. I don't think that's the way it's normally used in, in, in church circles, but sometimes in historical circles. Pretty much anything that's not Roman Catholic that comes out of the Reformation is called Reformed theology. I would want to narrow it considerably yeah. from that. The the sec so so for instance, just just to give an example, uh, Arminius could be called a Reformed theologian, even though he and his followers uh, articulated understandings of the Scriptures that that are contrary to the Reformed confessions. Uh, the second thing I think that people often say that is Reformed theology, but really isn't, is just a very basic. Uh, acceptance of the doctrine of predestination. So sometimes people will say that they're reformed, and what they mean is, I believe in election, or maybe right. a little more broadly, I'm a Calvinist. And while that is no question part of reformed theology, I don't think you can uh, accurately label yourself reformed without that. That's not the sum total. And that's probably the most popular answer that I hear, at least in American circles. People will say, I'm reformed. What they mean by that is, I'm some kind of Calvinist. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Why was there a need for a reformation in the first place, Jonathan? Well, the late medieval Roman church had obscured and in many ways lost the gospel. Um, when Calvin articulates, he, he answers this very question and he narrows it down to two things. First, he says the worship of the church needed to be reformed, that Roman Catholic worship was not according to the word of God. There were all kinds of accretions and, and additions to it that obscured what the Bible taught. So, so you weren't worshiping God in the manner that he taught. That was the first thing Calvin mentioned. The second thing he mentioned, and this is probably what we think of most, is that the way of salvation, the way in which God reconciles himself to sinners through Jesus Christ alone, as revealed in the scriptures, was also obscured. So those are two pretty major things. How do you come to God and worship as a human being, as a creature? And how can you possibly have reconciliation with the God against whom you've sinned? Yeah, yeah, great stuff. When you look at where we are today, I'm sure we've both heard people say that we could do with another reformation. Why is that? Well, I think what people generally mean, again, for, starts with worship. Um just like the late medieval Roman Catholic Church, many of our churches that would hold to the inerrancy of Scripture, for instance, would nonetheless say that worship is something that we can 
figure out on our own and that the Bible doesn't really give us any guidelines, certainly no real parameters uh, to, in order to tell us how to worship God. So I think worship is also at the forefront today. I think, too, today, uh, when we look at churches, and this, this overlaps with the worship question, but when we look at churches today, while they may affirm the inerrancy of Scripture, they don't affirm the sufficiency of Scripture. So one of the solas that I mentioned earlier was sola scriptura, and that means Scripture alone. And what we mean by that is not that we never read any other books but the Bible, but that the Bible holds final authority and that God's given us everything we need through the revelation in his word. And I think much of what you see in our modern, even evangelical churches, is a lack of confidence in the word of God. And so for that reason, for worship and in terms of our, our confidence in the sufficiency of scripture, many have said we could use a, a, another reformation. And, and in those terms, I think it's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Why does theology, and more so reformed theology, matter? And what are some ditches people can fall into if they do not hold on to a reformed understanding of Scripture, Jonathan? Yeah, that's a great question. Theology matters because, really, theological questions are the first and most fundamental questions we can ask and answer. We're creatures. We're entirely contingent. The Bible says, in him that is in God, we live and move and have our being. So if you're not asking theological questions as a human being, you're you're really not getting to the heart of your own existence or, or the most basic questions of life. So theology matters and theology has eternal significance for us as creatures. So because theology matters, getting it right matters. And and what what I would argue is that the scriptures are clear in terms of their understanding of God and ourselves and how we're reconciled to God through Christ and how we how we navigate life and what, what our guides are. And, uh, and so all these things are addressed directly by Reformed theology in, I think, a clear and biblical way. And, and so in that sense, you know, it, it couldn't be more important. Now, you know, the, the answer to your second question, I think there are there are a number of ways, there are a number of consequences of getting it wrong. If you get it wrong, if if you are not listening to what God says in his word about the way of salvation through Jesus Christ alone, well, that 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 is an eternal, that has an eternal consequence. You, you've denied the, the Son of God, sent by God himself to become man. If if you get it wrong in terms of the nature of your salvation being only by God's grace alone, only through faith alone, through Christ alone. That has massive consequences. If you if you get it wrong in terms of the Bible alone, will, will you, you'll be in the dark in terms of how to worship or even how to understand yourself, how to understand relationships. So I, I would say each of these solas that, that make up uh, Reformed theology are, are critical to our understanding of who we are as humans. And when it comes to covenant theology— I, I think that's the the overarching framework that the Bible gives us to understand itself, to understand the Word of God. And so, getting that wrong means you're you're missing yeah. the main point. And we've all yeah. been in situations where someone hears a a speech or a, a lecture or reads a book, and they grab onto one little thing that's relatively insignificant, and you say you missed the main point. You, right. you missed yeah. what exactly yeah. what the speaker was saying or what the author was doing. Or maybe, maybe you completely turned it on its head. And we're in danger of doing that with the Bible. And that's yeah. why I think covenant theology is critically important as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. So how important are the covenants to reformed theology and what do they mean to us today? Well, I think they're important because they're, they're the framework, the skeleton, if you will, that the Bible gives, that God gives to uh, show us who he is and how his salvation is worked out in Jesus Christ. So there, if, if you think of them as that way, as a support structure, or a skeleton of the whole scriptures, they really guide you through the Bible. So it starts with a covenant of works in the garden, which Adam and Eve break. And, and from that, we understand the, the full consequences of sin for the entire human race. And then God makes a covenant with Noah in which he graciously promises to withhold a uh, 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 full earth judgment until the end. And, and that sort of lays the, the, gives the preconditions for everything else. And then of course, God reveals himself to Abraham and God reveals himself to Moses and to David. And then he reveals himself uh, in, in the whole old Testament with respect to a new covenant. All of those things give us pieces of 
that revelation that we finally receive in Jesus Christ. So it helps us understand our Old Testament. It points us toward Christ. It helps us not to miss some of the significance of what who Christ is and what he does. That's pretty important. I mean, we 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 right. want to grow in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are Peter's last words to the church. Yeah. And one of the ways yeah. we do that is by looking at the covenant. So it helps us understand our Old Testament, our New Testament, helps us understand our salvation and our future hope. Yeah. What, what's the most common understanding of eschatology for people that hold on to a Reformed theology? That's a great question. I think it depends, de- uh, varies depending on the era that you're talking about. I think today, probably some kind of all millennialism is probably the most prevalent. I'm I'm guessing somewhat because it's hard to gauge all these things across the world. But usually uh, you see a lot of post-millennialism in, um, in the Puritan period. But when you look carefully at it, it's not quite the same as the post-millennialism we think of today. It's sort of what we might think of as a sort of modified amillennialism. And then there are eras, the 19th century in particular, where you do get some Reformed and Presbyterian thinkers who are pre-millennial in their eschatology. I would say in general, though, that's that's a bit of an outlier in, in the history of the of of the uh, ref, of Reformed thinking. Generally accepted that the Westminster standards are are e- e- allow for either an a uh, or post-millennial understanding. Yeah, when when you look at Reformed theology, one of the um, um people that you would most likely think of is somebody like John MacArthur. And he's got quite a unique um, uh, understanding of eschatology. Right? Tell us a little bit about that, Jonathan, if you can. Yeah, so he, what a what a remarkable preacher. He's been so used of God in so many ways. Um, but yes, his, his eschatology really doesn't fit in the normal pattern of Reformed thinking. He's, he's a very clear uh, dispensational premillennialist, and he has all kinds of reasons for that that he's articulated thoroughly over the years. He he would uh, he would see the, that as the most biblical understanding, the plainest reading of of the Bible. Uh, it is out of step with with the Reformed confessions, at least, and probably with most of Reformed history too. But and this is where we get back to that question of definition, which is tricky because yeah. someone like John MacArthur, you said, you know, he's he's one of the best known Reformed thinkers. Well, you know, in a strict sense, there would be many who would argue. Well, he's reformed in some ways, but but not in others. And um, and maybe eschatology fits into that category. But yeah, John MacArthur, Dr. MacArthur is um, is very uh, clearly a dispensational premillennialist. And, and he's yeah. and he's argued that that is most compatible even with his with his Calvinism, with his with his clear understanding of, of predestination. I should yeah, I should have so mentioned something thinking. earlier about covenants as well that may, may come up a little later in the conversation. I was thinking in your question about how covenants help us understand the Bible. They also help us to understand ourselves and the church because uh, because our the framework of our salvation is covenantal, I think. Uh, that means that we can understand the dynamics of our spiritual life as individuals in terms of being in a covenant with God. And, and also uh, even the nature of our church and the nature of our families is is. Um, we, we see through the grid, if you will, or the lens of, of the covenants. Yeah, yeah, really good stuff. Thank you. Jonathan, how does infant baptism fit with Reformed theology? Well, this connects directly with the covenants. So in the Old Testament, uh, God gives a, a covenant sign and seal to Abraham when he makes that great promise, which, by the way, the New Testament says we are participants in those Abraham, that Abrahamic covenant promise which is fulfilled in Christ, and we in Christ are participants in it. But he gives a sign and seal of the covenant. It's the sign and seal of circumcision, which is given to male children. And what that shows is that children, while they aren't able to actively believe when they're when they're babies, for instance, or infants, we don't know exactly uh, the way human development works there, but, but, but you know, undeniably, they're, they're brought into this. They're part of the visible covenant community. And so uh, what, what, Reformed theology is generally argued is in the New Testament, there's continuity, that the covenant sign and seal, which is baptism now and not circumcision, that covenant sign and seal is also applied not just to believers, but also to believers and to their children. Um, right. for, for And there's a similar logic behind it. Because we're part of a covenant community, because God operates in terms of a covenant, that covenantal structure is bound up in families. And so uh, circumcision then or, or sorry, rather baptism 
then is is the the replacement for circumcision and it's broader than circumcision as well it points to new realities and it and it encompasses both uh young boys and girls yeah and jonathan how, how does that play out in terms of you know there, there have been many believers before who, who believe in you know their children being under a covenant as well and then they'll live out their life and then not actually become you know be a christian should prove themselves to be a christian what does what our lived experience then teach us about this yeah well it's a it's a sad reality but it's not a new one um this is where looking at the old testament clearly um can can give us a lot of insight in, in a sense as sad as that is it's not a it's not a surprise because in the old testament there are many who received that sign of circumcision and moses at the end of deuteronomy says you you really what you really need is circumcision of the heart and so you, you you many of you have received the sign of circumcision uh on your bodies but you need circumcision of the heart and that's really the call of baptism as well uh baptism is a sign that points us towards washing the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the holy spirit and all these great inward realities but then it calls us to something what it calls us to is to repent and to believe in jesus christ and so baptism is meant to 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 seal something god's covenant promises you're part of that visible community and yet it's also a sign to point us to these realities of salvation that we need to take hold of in jesus christ ourselves so everyone in the church uh who's who's been baptized is called to embrace christ in in true repentance and faith and sadly um some some do not some turn away from that yeah. and uh and again though that's that's been a reality that that Moses spoke of even in the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. Yeah. When people think of reformed theology, they'll often go straight to Calvinism. Is that a fair link for people to make Jonathan? I think it's a fair link. I don't have a, I, I, I wouldn't push back too hard against that. Um, the only thing I would say is that I don't think simply Calvinism, if you, if you mean the five points of Calvinism tulip or something like that, really fully embraces what we mean. And 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 that's that's one of the probably most common misconceptions. I think I think in in this in the uh, American circles that I'm in, that's almost synonymous with reformed theology. And one of the things that I um I, I'm trying to make the case for in this little book is that no, actually reformed theology is a bit broader than that and has some implications that uh that go beyond just how it is that we're made right with God and who we are by nature as sinners. So good starting point for sure. And, and an important line of demarcation that I would wholeheartedly embrace. And yet probably not the full orbed picture of certainly what reformed theology meant when it was um, being developed in churches in the, in the 16 and 1700s. Yeah. Apart from John Calvin, who were the other key players that the Lord's used to establish and develop Reformed theology over the years? It's a long list. And you know what's interesting about that list is that most of the men, particularly in those early days, particularly in the 1500s, the early 1600s, most of the men that we would look to suffered greatly. So Calvin, it wasn't just what Calvin did in Geneva. It was also... Um, Ha the, the men he influenced, like John Knox, who took, in a sense, Calvin's principles, Calvin's understanding of worship, and and translated it into an English-speaking culture and took it back to Scotland when he was able to go back and establish the Scottish church. We see all a, a, a whole host of other French reformers who were doing the same kind of work, often under duress. And that, that's really one of the repeated themes, is that these men in the, in the early centuries— most of them suffered greatly because they were pushing against the grain, cutting against the grain. Um, the 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 big figures that we often look to today are often in the in the among the English Puritans. So now we're in the 16. Well, it goes it goes back to the beginning of the 1600s, but perhaps we think most of the 40, 1640s and 50s and 60s and 70s. And again, men who suffered greatly, but it was during that time in the 1640s that the Westminster Standards were written. And those really were the, in my opinion, high watermark of the Reformed confessional movement. There are other wonderful Reformed confessions that came before. I think Westminster encapsulates all of them the best. 
Um, and, and so some of those English Puritans that you'll read about in Banner of Truth books, those are those are some of the ones that we we look to today. Yeah. And who are some of the most helpful reformed writers and speakers of our day today? Oh, again, a long list. Um, many men that I look up to. Um, I've been so heavily influenced by men in the Banner of Truth circles. So Sinclair Ferguson and Ian Hamilton and Mark Johnson, th these men have had an incalculable influence on my own life. I, I've also, I was also influenced very heavily. I'd probably have to actually start here by uh, James Montgomery Boyce, who was a, a premillennialist, actually. You were mentioning eschatology earlier, but, um, but a very... Um, a powerful preacher of God's word. Um, so, so the list is long. I, I, I'm almost hesitant to name names because I know I'll forget someone who probably oh, I yeah. owe a huge debt to, and I don't mean to do that, but, but, um, but, you know, the other thing I'll say is this, I, I would add this, I mean, apart from naming specific names, what I've found is that some of the most helpful godly men who've really influenced my own life have been in, um, and smaller works, they're not heard of, they're not speaking at conferences on a regular basis, but they're faithfully working out the implications of this theology. Because this theology is meant to be worked out in the context of the church. And, and you can't really speak about, we've been speaking about Reformed theology almost in abstraction, like it's a mental construct. But really it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a way that the Bible applies to the church and guides our worship. I mean, worship was yeah. Calvin's yeah. first emphasis in the Reformation. And so um, what I've found is that the faithful men who are uh, Lord's Day by Lord's Day laboring to uh, to, to work these things out are, are, are the ones that, you know, I, I look to. And frankly, the ones I've benefited most from the 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 um, the, the men whose sermons I uh, stick most in my mind and whose example sticks most in my mind are not men that probably any of your uh, listeners would have heard of. Yeah, so true. So true. It seems that a renewed interest in Reformed theology is gaining momentum. Why do you think that is? I, I don't know entirely. I, I hope it's not just a cyclical thing where it's a fad. I think that there is a there are a couple features that that people are really grabbing onto. I, I do think there's a renewed interest in in what biblical worship looks like. We've been in such chaos for for decades, and, and, and there's been this implicit assumption that the, God doesn't tell us how to worship him. And you see this reflected in a lot of churches. And I think people have reacted against that. Is that really true? Does the Bible have nothing to say about this as things get crazier and crazier? Um, so I think there's that impulse. I think uh, there is a, there, there, while I don't want to make this a, a selling point, what I want to start with is the fact that it's biblical, but, but it's also, there's an intellectually satisfying element of Reformed theology answers a lot of questions that yeah. I think maybe more uh, unbalanced systems don't really have good answers for. So it gives a whole comprehensive set of answers to the most important questions of life, and they're biblical answers. They're they're insp answers inspired by God. I think that's part of it. I think too, it answers even questions about family um, and and our relationship to uh, our children and our parents that that um, people are asking today because of the chaos in the family. So there are a lot of things that have gotten undermined in the last 50 years. And, and it seems to me when I talk to people that some of the younger people are, are kind of picking their heads up and saying, what, what's going on here? We, we really need answers to these questions. These are vital questions. Yeah, 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 brilliant. One of the criticisms thrown at Reformed theology is that we've replaced the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit, with the Bible. What do you think when you hear people say that, Jonathan? Well, I understand it. It's it's a it probably points the finger at some of us. Maybe we haven't done a good enough job of articulating this, but it's actually kind of there's an irony to it because Calvin was known as the theologian of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Calvin, if you will, his whole theological project was designed to uh, tease out the implications of our high doctrine of God, the Holy Spirit. So, so it's, it's, it's unusual. But I, th I think most of the reason why people say it is because of the modern charismatic and Pentecostal movement, which has sort of cornered the market on defining what the Holy Spirit, uh, it, it, what, what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, what it is that he does. And, and, and they're, I think they're, off base in so many ways, but that's captured the popular imagination. So if you're not doing that, then you're not really paying attention to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
What I would say, though, again, is that the, the history of Reformed theology is about unpacking how God the Holy Spirit uses his word to shape all of all of life, all of worship, uh, all of our understanding of who we are. And, and so, you know, what the Bible shows us, and Calvin, again, is a good example of this, is that the spirit and the word work together. God, by his spirit, uses his word to do his work. So if you see the Bible at work, really in a really powerful way, what you're seeing is the Holy Spirit at work in a really powerful way. And, and so I, 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 but that, that involves uh, sometimes a, a little bit of a shift in people's thinking. Cause again, we're preoccupied today with defining the ministry of the Holy Spirit on the terms of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. Yeah. Yeah. Really helpful. Does reformed theology make human beings robots? No, no, robots, not at all. Um, no, it, it, but it, I, but I will say it, it reminds us that we're creatures. Um, so no, the, the Bible holds us responsible for our actions, for our decisions. There's no one who is going to, on the day of judgment, when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, there's no one who's going to, um, who's going to be able to say this is this is unjust or unfair um and and everyone will will bow the knee recognizing their own responsibility before the lord and their own rejection of his offering christ uh so so we're 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 responsible for our own actions but what it reminds us of is that we are creatures we are contingent and and we are sinners so those are the those are the labels i would go with not robots but creatures and sinners and and that I think is foregrounded in reform thinking. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. We're gonna take a real quick break before coming back and hitting you with the famous free signature bar question. There you go. We always give our guests the chance to finish with any closing thoughts and also do let people know how they can keep in touch with you on social media. Great. Well, thank you. I, I the only closing thought I would have is I I my my prayer in writing this book would was that it would be a clear introduction. It's really not. Uh, it's it's written for people who are totally new to this subject, so I hope it's um, accessible to everyone. And so if you have questions about it, I, I hope it, it it's a good resource. I pray that it will be. Um, in terms of getting in touch with me, I'm not on social media personally, but Greenville Seminary is. And so our website, gpts.edu, has all of our social media links at the bottom, our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all that stuff. And so uh, a lot of times they'll post things about me uh just because of the nature of it and, and, and other staff members as well so that's probably the best place is gpts.edu i also do host a podcast um for the alliance of confessing evangelicals and that's called theology on the go and that's available on all the podcast platforms uh, theology on the go and, and also it's housed at a website called place for truth Fantastic. Well, what we'll do, Jonathan, is we'll make sure that we grab all of those links and they'll be in the description wherever you're listening or watching this interview, as well as a link to the book, of course, as well, Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. Really oh, enjoyed hey, speaking to you. it's been a joy. Thanks. These are great questions. You went really easy on me. Um, and so uh, I appreciate that.